Hey guys, John Paulamy here, Actionable Intelligence. Today is Saturday, February 4th, and this is the weekly market report. The disclaimer, anything that you hear or see on this video or podcast is not to be taken as investment advice. I am not a financial advisor. I cannot give you personal financial advice. This is for informational purposes only. Please do your own due diligence. It's your money. It's your responsibility. Okay, so lots more very positive uranium news this week. Uh, the first item is that the yellow cake entity in the UK, which is similar to the Sprott Trust, uh, in the fact, at least in the fact that it uh, exists to go out and acquire physical uranium, um, did an offering this week uh, of fifty million dollars uh, to ostensibly, you know, buy more physical uranium, they actually have a deal with Kaz Adamprom that allows them to buy a certain quantity of uranium, I believe, every year. And so they have went out and, uh, you know, did, did a $50 million offering, and the response was positive enough or such that they raised the uh, offering to $75 million, uh, which is a 50% increase. So Yes, in the big scheme of things, $25 million is not a big deal, but I think it is a big deal in the fact that it's showing you that there's financial, there's interest, there's institutional interest in starting to come into these markets, okay? People can see what's happening. There's been enough news. Um, I think the energy crisis that happened in Europe, um, the war in Ukraine, it's kind of starting to focus people's minds around energy security and the role that nuclear power is going to pay, play in that. And then when you start looking at that, overall, you start realizing that, hey, there's a problem with the, uh, you know, under massive underinvestment that's taken place in the uranium mining market. And hey, that represents an opportunity. And so you're seeing that interest build, you're seeing that knowledge, uh, that news is getting out to folks. And that's what happens, right, in a bull market, right? You have your first movers, you have your early adopters, you have the people that smart money, if you will, people that, you know, speculators like myself that took early positions, and then you have to sit and wait. And then as the momentum builds, as the returns, as uh, the opportunity becomes, you know, this one tells this one and that one tells that one, and pretty soon everybody knows about it, and then the money starts coming in. So I think that, you know, we're, I'm not saying this particular news item is an indicative of that, but... This is just like, like I've said before, another brick in the wall in this massive positive uh, news flow that we've seen over the last, you know, six months or a year. Every week, you know, something more and more positive coming out, uh, giving more inertia, more of that tailwind to this story. So I uh, wanted to report that. I thought this was interesting. This was off Twitter. I, you know, most of the things I put on here, I you know, think in my best, in, but my best knowledge are true and accurate, but you never know. But this was off of uh, Twitter. And it was a blurb. I don't know, it was probably, from, I don't know where it was from. I don't remember off the top of my head, but I thought this was interesting. I think it kind of makes sense. And, and I'll tell you why after. So it says, uh, per Jander, director of WMC Energy, and it says here that they are a buyer of uranium on spot market for physical, Sprott Physical Uranium Trust. This is a, a statement, I guess, made in November 2022. Quote, utilities will not panic. They will just pay $100 a pound if needed to get uranium needed for all their reactors. And then this individual goes on to say, I know for a fact that there isn't a lot of uranium in the spot market because I tried to find uranium. Today, if I tried to get a, a million pounds of uranium in the spot market, you would easily see $5 a pound bump in, up in the uranium price, unquote. And I think this, uh, you know, I saw a news, I, I saw something recently this week, I think it was like five, six or seven days in a row that the Sprott Uranium Trust traded uh, with a positive net asset value. So, of course, the management there issued units to get cash to enable them to buy additional uranium. That's what they do when they when the um, net asset value turns positive, they have the ability to go to the market, issue more units or shares, however they're classified, 
and then uh, have that cash available for the their mandate, which is to purchase uranium in the spot market. And uh, typically, they announce that when they do that, they announce that they bought any uranium, uh, and they did. I thought saw a transaction it was like two. It was this oddball transaction, like it was like an odd lot. It was like two hundred ninety three pound ninety three thousand pounds. You know, usually I see it's like okay, they bought five hundred thousand pounds, two hundred fifty thousand pounds. It was like this oddball number, two hundred ninety three. That makes me wonder if it's like, hey, sell me whatever you got. Oh, I have two hundred ninety three thousand pounds. You know, I have two hundred, you know, left in the warehouse. It's, it, I don't know if that's true or not, but it kind of makes sense, right? Because we've heard this. You know, this is the whole point of these entities is to hoover up all this excess supply. And so if this is accurate, if this is true, then there really isn't a lot of material left in the spot market. Now, there will always be some material, I think, in the spot market just because of, you know, some mining setups like BHP in um, Australia. I think Uzbekistan uh, sells a lot on the spot market. But um, you know, this, if it's true, makes a lot of sense. And this is, again, positive, you know, you really aren't going to go to the spot market and just, you know, buy all the uranium you want. And I think that mindset has shifted. That used to be a, you know, abundance mindset that was in that people had around the spot market because we were oversupplied, right? And I think that's now dissipated. Of course, I'm a generalist investor. I just go on, you know, follow the what I perceive as experts in this and do my own reading. But, you know, I'm not following the uranium market on a, you know, daily basis, minute to minute. So, but uh, this is exactly what I say too. U utilities will not panic. They'll just pay $100 a pound and they'll just pay whatever's required to keep those reactors running just because of the fact that they have such large capital sunk costs you can't afford to have the thing not running because you don't have any fuel for it. I mean, if it came down to it, they would go to the trusts and pay a wild premium. And I think the trust would sell the uranium, you know, based, you know, th that would be in their fiduciary interest. So I don't think there'll ever be a shortage. I think if we have a blowout, that's what you'll see. You'd, you'd see some utilities go to some of these uh, trusts and buy the uranium from them at a very large premium, more than likely. So um, we'll see how it plays out, but uh, I thought this was uh, actually for such a small blurb, quite a bit of information actually uh, in this um, in this tweet. I like these visuals, kind of, you know, we've talked about this many times before. I follow this. You can go to the World Nuclear Association, World Nuclear News. You should be following those websites. You can be tracking. I think World Nuclear News has a new build tab. Anytime like any major event happens at one of the builds, like installation of the pressure vessel, containment, first pour, whatever, they track all that. So it kind of gives you, if you're a news junkie on uranium, you can see the progress that's happening or when a new plant uh, reaches first criticality or goes on the grid, something like that. But anyways, this is just a graphic that shows the, um, top 10 countries by nuclear capacity under construction. Obviously, China is blowing everybody else away. They're on a massive build, followed by India. Um, and then, you know, I was actually shocked by this um, uh, I was actually shocked by Turkey being the fourth largest country with reactors uh, being built. That kind of I did not know that, but that makes sense also. So, um, yeah, I mean, the demand picture is clear. It's just going to get better over time. I think that, you know, with the crisis that happened in Europe, uh, you know, Europe got a little lucky just as a side tangent. It got lucky. They had a warm winter. You know, they spent basically half a trillion euros buying up every LNG cargo they could get their hands on, along with um curtailing quite a bit of industry to you know get through the winter and then couple that with basically a warmer than forecasted no, warmer than normal winter uh they got lucky so i don't know if that's going to be sustainable going forward i don't think you want to have as a policymaker you know betting that you're going to get consistently warmer than normal winters as your energy policy but we'll see
I say that in the context of a news item I saw where the Belgians basically are going to leave a couple few reactors. I don't know the exact amount. I think it was four reactors that they were intending on shutting down. I saw a news blurb that they're going to continue to let them run. Um, you're seeing more and more of this, right? You're seeing extensions. You're seeing reactors that we were originally shut down, continue to let them run. And uh, I think that uh, you're going to see more of that, at least in countries that uh, are looking at, you know, energy security vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, some of these other fantasies that were being uh, portrayed. So this is a uh, long-term chart going back to 2011 of the Global X Uranium ETF. Um, and this is basically the Fukushima, after Fukushima time frame. And so you had this long bear market, right, that went on for nine or 10 years. And you had, we, we know the story, we know the history, we know the sustained low prices, which basically had you uh, consuming the, the uranium that had been found and put online uh, in the prior investment cycle. So we've chewed through all that. That's why you've seen the price come down uh, for so long, uh, why you had that bear market, there was no interest. And then, you know, we saw this thing kind of bottom in 2020. Uh, we had the big, you know, we had a big drop here. Uh, this looks like a monthly chart. So this looks like the big drop during the, you know, pandemic sell-off. Then it, you know, rapidly rebounded because we're in a bull market now, right? We're we're in a long-term bull market. We are in a uh, secular uh, situation that under investment, we're consuming, you know, uh, the, like I said, the investment, we're living off the carcass of previous investment. And so we've had insufficient investment and we still have a uranium price that is not sufficient in order to stimulate new capital to be directed to uranium mining. And so in order for that to happen, we need a uranium price substantially higher. And I think that's, you know, a lot of people are saying that's, well, people were saying a couple of years ago, that was a $60 range, probably $70, $80 now, just because of inflation uh, and other things that have happened. Uh, and so we haven't seen that incentive price. When we need an incentive price to stay there, go there and stay there for some period of time for people to say, okay, I'm going to get in the uranium business. I'm going to actually build this mine. And so um, uh, what I put here as a title of the slide is, would you like to be short this market? And if you did not know this was the uranium mining long-term chart, and you look at this, would you say, hey, look, this looks like a recovering situation. Um, if I could have to go long or short here, would I want to go long or short? I mean, you had this initial basically move from around, you know, seven or eight bucks to, you know, close to 20 uh or close to 30 and that's a four bagger and then you know that would happen over one two years and then you have a year of consolidation and now you know you see how things are tightening up you're starting to see you know this is kind of tightening into a you know wedge and these wedges usually uh will well they don't usually they will either um resolve upwards or downwards and typically uh, they resolve in the direction of the previous move so i don't want to get too far in a technical analysis we know the fundamentals but i think that you're going to see the uh, movement of uh, money into this market this year and i think you're going to see the move you know two years a two-year big move off the bottoms a year of consolidation or so a year or so of consolidation and then okay we're ready for the next move we've just, you know all the tourists have left all the hot money left. And, you know, I never sold a share during this whole thing. Uh, you know, of course, I was buying back, you know, in these areas back here. Uh, I was way early to this, but um, I haven't sold a share. And I know that most of the people that are, uh, you know, longer term investors haven't sold a share either. So we had a lot of people come into this during this move, during this peaks here. You know, that's when you had the peak news. This is when you had the $200, you know, a pound uranium discussions and things like that. And that's usually a sign of an intermediate top. And that's what we had. You know, we had to take off that excess. And now we're, you know, I think poised for a move higher. I mean, the fundamentals are definitely uh, biggest tailwinds I've ever seen in a market uh, that I've ever seen in any market. 
uh, as at least as it applies to the uranium market. Things just continue to get better as we chronicle here uh, on a weekly basis. So I thought this was an interesting news item. It looks like Sprott just went full goblin this week with some ETFs. Um, this wasn't the only ETF they uh, introduced. They introduced one for, I think, copper juniors and intermediates and another one for like clean energy or batteries. I, I don't know. I don't remember off the top of my head, but this is what struck my interest was the um, beginning of this uh, initiation of the Sprott Junior Uranium Miners ETF. Like I said, these uh, uranium mining or these ETFs were brought online this week. I think there's three of them, but we'll focus uh, for purposes of this conversation on the Uranium Junior Uranium Miners ETF. The symbol is URNJ. It's uh, trading already. It says it's the only ETF to provide pure play exposure to small exploration and development stage uranium miners with the potential for revenue and asset growth. URNJ seeks to provide investment results that before fees and expenses correspond generally to the total return performance of the NASDAQ. Sprott Junior Uranium Miners Index, which is designed to track the performance of mid, small, and micro cap companies in uranium mining related businesses. Okay, these are the companies that, you know, all the people want to buy to get rich. So one of the criticisms or one of the things people don't like about like the URNM or URA is that they are market cap weighted, which means that when you buy URNM, for example, uh, which is the Sprott Uranium Miners ETF, uh, you're going to get a lot of large cap companies, right? You're going to get most of the holdings are going to be weighted towards Kaz Adam Prom, Cameco, the Uranium Trust, the Sprott Uranium Trust, Yellow Cake, because they have the higher market caps. And then you're going to get a sprinkling, whatever's left over of, you know, and you can go look this up what the percentages are, but the large majority of the market cap in the uranium industry is by those kind of entities. And then you're going to get a sprinkling of the juniors, right? And so although it's done done well over time, and it will continue to do well, you're not going to get the same torque and leverage in a bull market that you would get from the juniors. Now, as I've said before many, many times, if you go through and look at the um, holdings of this ETF, which I recommend you do before you jump in, you will see that most of the companies are, as it says here, uh, small and micro cap companies uh, that are engaged in um, exploration and development. And so they do not have cash flow. So the problem is, is that, you know, what you will notice on Twitter, or if you talk to people that are speculating in uranium stocks, they have their, they have their baby, they have their little kid uranium stock that they love. They know everything about XYZ junior uranium mining exploration development company. And they can tell you why it's going to be outperform every other junior mining exploration company. And it very well could happen. Um, I play Powerball when it gets above $500 million. I have no idea. I have no expectation that I'm going to win, but somebody's going to win. And for, you know, it's kind of fun to speculate what you would do if you were given, you know, like when Mega Millions was over a billion dollars. I mean, somebody won it. Uh, so it's kind of the same mentality here. A lot of these things are lottery tickets. They are trading sardines. They are burning matches. They have no revenue. They have no, they have no uh, sales. They have no way of generating any incoming cash except for to issue more shares. And so unless you're absolutely right, unless you have a company that has a path towards um, getting a mine up and running or selling a project to a larger company that can do it, you're basically, it's basically sugar plums and unicorns. You're speculating. You're, you're hoping that you can sell it for a higher price. You're hoping that a massive wind comes along of, you know, interest in the uranium stocks. A lot of money comes in and basically carries all uranium names higher. And that's probably what will happen. In the interim, though, you can have something go. If you're just going to put all your, you know, most of your money in a couple names, um, you're not, you, you may hit it, but then more than likely you won't. I mean, what's your chances if you look at all the uranium companies, if you are going to pick the one that's going to go up 10,000%? So 
I think for the, what I'm getting at is unless you're like, you know, um, focused on uranium every day and you know these companies inside and out, if you talk to the managements, if you've been to the projects, if you understand geology, if you understand how mining the Lasan curve works as you go from um, discovery through feasibility to bankability to, you know, building the mine, unless you understand all of that, this is probably the best vehicle. If you're a generalist investor and you want to get that additional torque uh, that would come along, you know, kind of set and forget, um, you get the general trend, you understand what's happening, you know, uh, at a 30,000 foot level with the supply demand dynamics, then this gives you an opportunity to speculate, but gives you diversification. You don't have to then go and do the research uh, on each individual company to figure out, you know, which one is the one, you know, because somebody doesn't get financing. I mean, there's companies out there, I'm not going to name them. They're just lifestyle companies, guys. The executives go to, go to conferences, they go on podcasts, they go on sh different shows on YouTube, you know, who, you probably can figure out who they are and they talk a good game and they continue to issue shares. They have all kinds of, uh, you know, related party transactions going on that if you dig through the financials, um, the SEC submittals, you would see, but most people don't do that. And so that's not every company, but there's companies like that out there. And if you're buying one, there's people out there that buy these things and they think those are the winners. That's the horse that they're going to put their money on. And so this is pure speculation in these junior companies, as I've explained many, many, many times before. Like I've said before, go to one of the mining conferences in Canada, like they have in Vancouver. It will seriously dissuade you of what's really of any kind of um, trust. Uh, what do you call it? Well, let's put it this way. You really have to be, you know, buyer beware. OK, there's a lot of people selling moose pasture in Saskatchewan uh, and the amount of companies that are going to actually build a mine uh, and produce uranium in this cycle are not as many as people think. So this is a good bet for the generalist investor that wants additional torque in addition to, you know, um, what the larger companies that are actually investments. You know, you can analyze Cameco and Kaz Adamprom on you can do discounted cash flow. You could say what they're, you can look at their enterprise value. You can actually do that, okay? With these juniors, you're just speculating. Like I said, they're trading sardines. And so this vehicle, uh, I think, gives you that opportunity. You'll see one of the things to pay attention to is it only has $2 million under asset, assets under management. Now, I anticipate that will grow over time, but, you know, that that's not a lot. So you could see some volatility here. Uh, if you do have a downturn and people pull cash out, I mean, this could be, uh, but I don't, I don't think that's the case. I think we're at the cusp of a bigger move higher. And, uh, you know, one of the things that uh, I have said in the past, and we were talking about it on the Discord, uh, and if you want to become part of the Discord, let me just uh, throw this out. That's one of the benefits of becoming a subscriber to the Actionable Intelligence Alert newsletter. You have access to the Discord channel. I think it's pretty good. We have a lot of smart guys on there, and we have a lot of these discussions on there uh, uh, during the week. And these guys are constantly, you know, we got top-notch guys on there finding, digging out these nuggets of information that I, I don't even find myself. So uh, some of the things that you hear on this weekly uh, video or podcast are a direct result of the interactions we have on that Discord channel. But anyways, one of the things we were talking about is uh We've said I've said in the past that sometimes when entities issue ETFs or delist an ETF, that can be a contrarian indicator. Like if you start seeing ETFs being issued for, um, uh, you know, something, then you can say that that's just an example of an asset management company wanting to take advantage of a hot trend. Conversely, uh, if you see an ETF go away, like the coal ETF went away because there was no interest. The shipping ETF went away because it had no interest. And that was right around the bottom of both those markets. Um, these are general rules. These are not, you know, every time that somebody issues an ETF, that's a sign of a top. That's not, you know, that's not a hard and fast rule. It's just another tool that you can look at. 
Now, Sprott, to my mind, is a little bit different, right? Because they um, are a specialized firm that specializes in this stuff. They have a lot of relationships with these companies. They actually know what's going on. If I saw like, you know, BlackRock or somebody else, one of these, you're going to, you're probably going to see when this thing takes off and starts attracting a lot of news and makes new highs and all that stuff that you will see these other ETF um, companies uh, issue um, uranium, you know, ETFs, because they'll get a sense that, hey, there's a lot of money flowing into this. Our whole deal is to get assets under management. That would be more of an indicator. I don't think that the Sprott entity here is an indicator of a top um, because we just simply, the fundamentals aren't there. Now, are we heading towards that? Yes. Uh, I believe that 2023 will be a pretty good year for us. Uh, I'm anticipating that. But, you know, you can't tell the future. But no, I don't think that this is a contrarian indicator. If it was another fund ETF or fund company doing this, I would kind of raise an eyebrow. But uh, with Sprott doing it, I don't. Uh, they're kind of in a different league. This is kind of really their, what they do. They kind of understand these markets. So anyways, you can take a look at this uh, if it meets your needs. Uh, I took a small, I took a position just for the sake of it, you know, show some support. And um, you can see all the companies that are trading in it. Now, again, you're going to get, uh, I think this gives you a way to hit your wagon to some higher returns if we, in fact, do have a uranium bull market because you're going to be, a lot of these juniors are going to run. Um, but there's always going to be the guy that says, well, I had the lottery ticket or I was riding the winning horse. Okay. If you can tell me which one of the companies is that with hundred percent certainty, which of course no one can, then I'll, I will advocate for that company, but that's just simply not the case. And so I think this gives you a tool. It's another vehicle that you can use if you're interested in getting some more torque, uh, but be aware, you know, that it is, you know, it's just starting out. It doesn't have a lot of assets under management, so it could fluctuate quite a bit. Uh, in the near term until they build some momentum. And I'll be curious to see um, how the AUM grows over time, if it's showing interest. You know, these guys, one thing that Sprott has is a very good marketing arm for a lot of their investors, which are tilted towards hard assets and resource testing and how they market this to them and uh, if that draws in capital. So we'll, we will see. Uh, I wanted to bring this to your attention again. Like I said, they kind of went goblin mode. There was a couple other ones they issued this week too. I, like I said, around copper and I think battery metals. So um, I will put a link to the spread or to the presentation that they have up that goes over all of these and and what the what their perceived advantages of. It's you know it's marketing, but you can take a look at it. Okay, switching back to something I mentioned just a minute ago. Um, Lower gas prices too late for some German industry. So again, you know, we've seen one of the things we forecasted was, you know, we thought if we had a, with the situation with the turning off of cheap Russian gas to Western Europe, particularly Germany, the destruction of the Nord Stream pipelines, you know, we thought that we would have a massive natural gas crisis in Europe. That was sort of alleviated for a year like I've said before, for several reasons, we've had basically a record higher temperatures. It's very been an unseasonably warm winter in Europe. They've got extremely lucky that they had a warm winter so far. Uh, this was coupled with, of course, shutting down of a lot of industry that was energy intensive. Um, and also the fact that um, they basically, the Europeans, went around and basically printed a lot of euros and went around the world and paid whatever they had to pay to get any kind of LNG cargo to come to Europe, basically to the tune of a half a trillion euros, which basically negatively affected countries like Pakistan, for example, which a lot of the developing countries that don't have the ability, don't have the resources, couldn't, couldn't compete and were outbid. And so they, you know, this is why you're having energy crisis, like uh, the energy crisis that you are seeing basically got transferred to developing countries like Pakistan and several other, which aren't in the news, which that didn't impact the, the global economy as much. But, you know, you got Pakistan with a country of 220 million people that's having blackouts because they, they don't have insufficient energy and they're not ability, they don't have the ability to pay up and outbid Europeans. And so, and this was a tweet that linked to a Bloomberg article. I do not subscribe to Bloomberg. So I cannot give you 
the specifics of the article, but basically, or the gist of it from this tweet is, the drop in natural gas prices won't rescue Germany's industries. The damage is done. Companies, including BASF, which is, I think, the world's largest chemical company, Dow Chemical, Lanexis, are set to cut jobs and shift investment out of Germany. EU energy prices still higher than in the U.S. and parts of Asia. So even with everything that happened and the plunge in prices that were, you know, basically at unsustainable levels, um, it's still higher than it is in the U.S. or Asia. I mean, we have under $3 in MCF for gas in the U.S. because we have had unseasonably, you know, warm, relatively, you know, speaking, warm winter here in the U.S. also. So um, natural gas demand just wasn't uh, as high as it needed to be. And so, you know, these companies are looking at, you know, they're looking at, you know, the United States has, you know, 650 trillion cubic feet of gas reserves, you know, in your, those that's going to go up over time as you drill more and, and, and certify those resources. But it's like, okay, if I'm going to build a factory, a chemical plant that needs natural gas inputs, I'm just going to either build greenfield or expand my brownfield operations in the U.S. That just makes more sense. Um, and that's what you see. I mean, it's amazing when I go to the solar plant that I'm building, I have to drive through the east side of Houston on the Beltway, which goes over the ship channel bridge. And you can look down that ship channel and just see this, I don't even know what it's worth, trillions of dollars worth of chemical industry that's, you know, with all kinds of product tankers coming and going. And, uh, you know, if you have the ability, why not just expand your operations, you know, in Pasadena, Deer Park or wherever, Seabrook and uh, Texas City, whatever, those areas and instead of you know you just can't competitive you can't be competitive in europe i mean the wages the environmental regulations and now the inputs both fuel and uh feedstock are too high so this is uh this is again you know a lot of people are dunking and saying yeah uh the energy crisis bros were wrong look, Europe made it through, it wasn't a problem, yada, yada, yada. Well, you just have a, you're in a hiatus, you got lucky. So we'll see, uh, the, we'll see what happens, but this isn't positive for the EU or Germany in particular. So I thought this was interesting, uh, BP to pursue narrower, e, narrower ESG goals. BP will dial back its push into renewable energy. Hmm, I wonder why. Let's look. Disappointed in the returns from some of the oil giant's renewable investments, CEO Bernard Looney, appropriate name possibly, plans to pursue a narrower green energy strategy and place less emphasis on environmental, social, and governance goals to help clarify that those aren't distracting the company from its ability to deliver profits, according to people familiar with recent discussions. Analysts and some investors say BP's pledges to shift away from fossil fuels and into renewable energy risk handicapping the company's performance. Mr. Looney declined to comment. So I think I showed the chart last week that uh, the European uh, super majors, Total, BP, Shell, basically on a free cash flow basis have outperformed their North American peers quite a bit. And... Uh, you know, basically, the returns are not the, are not that high in renewable energy. The, here's the problem, okay? You have an industry re, being rebuildables that basically cannot sustain itself. The returns are not high enough um, if it wasn't subsidized. The subsidies are what allow it to be competitive with other forms of energy. With gas at two seventy five or under three dollars in MCF, these things are just not competitive. And, you know, as I showed last week, you know, the cost, and I'll show another slide here in a minute, the cost of like wind energy is going up. Well, why is that? You know, people thought that, you know, solar and wind are kind of like microchips. They just get cheaper and cheaper over time. No, because they have commodity inputs. And as the commodities rise in price, oh, guess what? The price of the end product goes up. And so 
this was all greenwashing and virtue signaling and you don't make money doing that they, they can't make the same returns and renewables i'm not i don't know about every one of their projects but i know that the the projects that they can do at current you know and forecasted oil and gas prices are substantially higher than they are in renewables and so as this ESG thing, you know, we made a video maybe a couple months ago about peak ESG. I think we've reached peak ESG. Now we're seeing major investment companies like BlackRock and Vanguard back away from ESG. Now we're actually seeing these oil companies that went full knee deep into this a couple of years ago. Looney was bragging about how, you know, we need to, we're going to get off fossil fuels. We're going to get away from fossil fuels. It's a big commitment for us, blah, blah, blah. And now it sounds like, you know, they're back and they're crawfishing away from it now. Okay. You don't want to be the last one at the party espousing ESG as your returns go down and the rest of your peers are focusing on their core business. The core business of BP is the finding and extraction and processing and distribution of oil and gas. That's what they should stick to. Okay. Let other companies focus on renewables this is not your core business and if you take your eye off the ball you're going to suffer and so it sounds like you know that's what they're going to do now if you read the i think the bp energy outlook came out this week i just downloaded i haven't got a chance to read it. i think i read the first uh introduction to it you know that's the that's the uh, report that bp puts out just about all of world energy it's really if you're interested in energy you should really download it and take a look as tons of information in it but i do think that the i uh, started reading the introduction last night but i didn't get too far but it's still kind of talking about you know oil demand going away peaking you know we need to you know get co2 down the same tropes but i think and you know that's all as i've said before watch what they actually do not what they say okay talk is cheap and you know if they were serious about it, why not just sell off all their assets in oil and gas and go fully into renewables? Save the world, okay? Because it's an oil and gas company, that's why. And when they saw the free cash flow that they had this year, they're thinking, hmm. And they see everybody else starting to back away from ESG. It's a herd mentality like everything else, okay? These people, uh, you know, all hang around with each other. And, you know, banks were telling them. Wall Street was telling them, you know, you need to be ESG, blah, blah. That was the that was the zeitgeist. That was the cool thing. That was the in thing. All the conferences, they were talking about this. And so, you know, then everybody realized, hey, you're going to lose a lot of money doing this. And, you know, we're in this to make money, not lose money, I guess. So who knows what the conversations are at the board level? Uh, we know that Mr. Looney has declined to comment because, you know, like I said, two years ago, he was – he was like the biggest proponent of this. Now he has nothing to say. Well, the fact that they had double digit free cash flow yields probably had something to do with it. He was probably told by the board, hey, dial it down. So anyways, we'll see if this continues or not. We'll see what this really manifests as action. Like I said, it's easy to talk or just do a few projects here and there. Well, you're talking about companies with, you know, this company had, another company had record, um, I think record profits this year. And so, you know, throwing a few hundred million dollars at a couple wind farms or whatever, or solar plants, you know, you can do that and then point at that and say, look, look what we did. So anyway, that's my view. We'll see how it goes. But I think this is interesting. We're seeing more of this, not less of this. So I think, like I said, I think we did reach peak ESG and now things are shifting as we as we thought they would. I wanted to point this out. You know, oil prices have not really been strong lately. As a matter of fact, they've been quite weak. And last couple, couple days got creamed. And so here we have what I consider one of the biggest reverse barometers out there. He basically comes out and says on a tweet on Friday, yesterday, with this level of employment, because they had this fake, uh, well, I don't want to say that. They had this positive employment news come out. Uh, it's time to start buying the oils. This is the, you know, lack of second. This this is the typical way that many investors think, oh, um, yeah, more employment means more economic activity means more oil. I need to buy oil stocks. Um, that's not really how this works, but that's beside the point. So 
Um, obviously, the stocks got creamed. Uh, oil price got creamed. But again, you know, I'm sticking to my theme. You know, um, the U.S. is probably in a recession or heading for a recession. Europe's in a recession. Um, but, you know, we have China coming out of the lockdowns. We have the stimulus that they provided, billions and billions hundreds of billions of dollars in stimulus equivalent. And so these things take time, right? They just came out of this thing a month ago. We have saw the travel data data uh, for the new year. It's humongous. We've seen, you know, um, we're tracking this. And that doesn't just, you know, change everything in a, in a minute. They stockpiled a lot of um, product or a lot of oil and other commodities. So they have to burn through this. So I did find it interesting that uh, the government in China basically told the refiners to uh, not export clean products, clean products being, you know, refined products, because the demand's coming back, right? And so that will put pressure on other Asian refiners to increase their capacity, drawing in more oil. So these things take time is what I'm saying. Okay, it's the same thing. So I'm going to be talking about in this issue, uh, this month's issue of the Actionable Intelligence Alert newsletter, my base case for 2023 around the economy and, you know, how it's going to play out. You know, I think we're going to get the China bump. Uh, will it be sufficient to bring everything back? I don't know. But again, um, you know, you could probably see additional uh, oil weakness in the short term. Uh, we have to wait for that uh, demand to come back from China fully. And like I said, they were stockpiling uh, oil. Uh, in the interim, we have to burn through that and whatever that equilibrium of that returning uh, demand, uh, whatever it level sets at, uh, we'll have to wait and see. We'll also have to see, you know, how much how bad these recessions are going to be and how much they dampen, you know, energy. Uh, I mean, it just throws a wet blanket on it. Right. So you don't. And then again, as I've said before, you know, we are in a negative liquidity cycle. Right. We have government with the exception of China. OK, reliquifying its system. We have all the other countries are doing quantitative tightening and raising rates. Okay, so that's not positive for risk assets uh, like oil and, and these natural resources. Yes, ultimately the fundamentals play out, but as we said before, so many times before, in the short term, um, liquidity and sediment are what drive the market. So I'm still, nothing's changed fundamentally for me longer term, um, uh, but you know we'll see. I don't see a 2008 type great financial crisis. Um, I think that the Fed's got it wrong. Um, they started raising rates. I mean, this time last year, we only, you know, we were still basically coming off. They just had started raising rates. So it takes, you know, as Milton Friedman said, it takes about a, it takes a while for this monetary positive or negative um, impulses to make it through the economy up to a year. So with rates at 5%, we haven't even seen the full effect. So you're going to start seeing the full effect of this recession that we're probably already in start manifesting in early spring in the numbers. I mean, you're already seeing it in conference board indicators uh, being, you know, in prior, you know, the pro conference board leading indicators have 100% forecasting ability on the last like seven or eight recessions. So those are negative. Your manufacturing orders and indexes are now in recessionary levels, which have been at levels that have indicated recession in the past. And so, you know, you can't look at employment. Employment is a lagging indicator, guys. So and it's subject to quite a few re revisions. So you want to look at stuff that's more current and what's more, um, you know, it's like going to the doctor and he takes your blood pressure and it's high, but he doesn't have the, re he also takes a blood sample, but he doesn't have the results for the blood sample um, for a week or so, right? So, um, he doesn't have the full picture uh, because you have these other indicators that are lagging uh, your blood work. You can't just base the person's health just on one blood pressure reading. So it's kind of the same thing, uh, but it's obvious to me we're entering a recession. If we're not already in a recession, just based on the indicators and what. And so how much of an effect does that have? You know, you got to play macro economist, and I'm not that person. I know that we've had underinvestment. One of the major importers of oil is now went basically from, you know, being locked down to fully open. How that responds, the initial impetus and blast off from lockdown to opening, and then how that levels out, then we'll have more information. But could oil go down? Could Brent go down to 60? Possibly. Could it go to 50? Possibly. But it will not stay there for very long. Uh, 
Will that affect oil field services? Yes, the stocks will come down. Maybe some uh, final investment decisions will get delayed. But again, you know, what are the central banks and governments going to do if they go into recession? <laughs> I'm going to, you know, I'll go out on a limb and say this. I'm going to also say this in the newsletter this weekend. This time next year, we're going to be, at, you know, the Fed funds rate is going to be at like one or two percent possibly. So when they start cutting rates, they don't do it like, you know, they, they cut quickly because it's in a recession. So the, and the reversal of QT will happen and then you'll reliquify the system. And so you will solve the liquidity issue that's uh, kind of a wet blanket. That's that's kind of how I'm base case in this. Like I said, I'll explain it more in the in this month's newsletter. If you're a subscriber, you'll see that probably by the end of the weekend. So this was interesting. Siemens Gamesa, which is the, I think, second largest wind power provider. This was a combination of Siemens' wind uh, company and Gamesa, which was a Spanish manufacturer. They call it Siemens Gamesa. I actually installed some of these turbines about four years ago at a site in Illinois. I basically say their onshore wind turbine orders down 46%. This is in their quarterly report, and their costs are up 25%. So you have, here's onshore order intake uh, year over year is down uh, 46%. And the average selling price is up 25%. Well, why is that? Well, we explained that earlier. It says, uh, here they say order intake continues to reflect protected to get partially driven by macro environment and new commercial terms. Uh, I'm not going to go through this whole thing. I didn't listen to the conference call. Basically, you know, we this is something we've seen similar at Vestas and also GE, which are the other large entities. Uh, and then I didn't put this slide up, but the orders for offshore wind for Siemens Gamesa were zero. They didn't have any orders relative to last year. So you're seeing the cost inflation that's going to turn people off i mean so what happens is the price of copper goes up the price of transportation goes up because of the higher oil prices yada 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 all these inputs and then you get to the final product and then a developer looks at that plugs it into their model and then their internal rate of return drops this project is not viable with these turbines costing this much that's how this works guys you know you go out and find a piece of land that's you know, viable, you put up uh, these temporary um, measuring devices for a year or two to measure the wind. And then you plug that into your model. They have all these programs and spreadsheets and PhDs looking at this, these developers do. And then you say, okay, you start putting your model together. This is what we forecast the production would be. Here's the data uh, for this area. We plug it into the model, we make certain assumptions. And then what's the capital cost? What turbines are we going to use? What kind of deal can we get from these people? How much are the how much is it going to cost? You plug that capital cost and you take your operating costs to operate the site and maintain the site. You plug all that in and then it spits out a number at the bottom. It tells you what your return. I mean, your cost, your interest cost goes into this with interest rates up now massively. Uh, you're not on zero anymore. Uh, you have a higher hurdle rate now to make a project viable. And so this is why the orders are going down. It has nothing to do with, uh, well, they're just waiting. You know, uh, you have higher costs, higher rates, and less viable locations. Uh, so there's, you know, um, that's part of the problem. And like I said, these things that, that, you know, these models take into account all of these variables. And like I said, spit out a number at the bottom. And then you go to a, you gate this at some decision level at a board level or whatever, Whatever the investors are at a board level or pension fund has an investment board, these things are taken to them. They're like, okay, well, we thought you told us these things are going to be eight or nine percent returns. And this thing, you know, saying three or four percent, we're not going to, you know, take the risk. So that's what's happening. And that's what happens. So unless costs come down uh, and rates come down, uh, even with the subsidies and the backing of the governments. Um, it's a lot of these projects are not viable. I'm seeing a lot of it in solar now. I'm seeing a lot of people saying, well, you know, even with the Inflation Reduction Act and all of the incentives, um, we can't make this work at, at the current interest rates. We cannot make this work at the current cost for the rebuildables. The panels uh, are costing too much or the lead times. And so uh, all these things, like I said, go into models and you can't make it work. And I think it's shocking a lot of people because we were told people 
a lot of people said, well, the price of solar panels have come down over the last, you know, 20 years. That's true. There's been technological advancements and manufacturing advancements and volume, you know, your, your price per unit goes down over time. But again, what's the inputs into a panel? Aluminum, polysilicon, silver, copper, some type of rare metals in some cases, steel for the piles and all the torque tubes and everything. So these things were going up, the, 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 the amount to transport them, okay? The machines that you need to build the site, the cranes, the telehandlers, all that stuff, all the costs have went up. And so maybe we have this period of disinflation and rates come down and maybe this becomes more viable again. But right now, this is, this is the problem. The costs are too high and these projects are not viable. So sometimes comedy is rooted in truth. And I thought this was funny. You know, you have France over here with their new uh, majority. You know, they had the big nuclear build out in the 70s and early 80s in France. That's why they haven't been as affected as, as affected uh, during this energy crisis, even though they've done all they can to scuttle their advantage in uh, having cheap and reliable nuclear power. Talking about shutting plants down, not maintaining them properly, this kind of nonsense. Then you have Germany over here with the Energy Vende with their wind turbines and of course they're not doing this but it kind of gives you you know germany's actually relying on a lot of imports from france and their nuclear generation to sustain their electrical uh demand and so i think this is uh, kind of funny this is of course mr Habeck, i think you know with his uh you know his children the children's book author who's now the expert on everything in europe or in the eu with his no tie you know frumpy you know, or I guess that's the cool thing, you know, you don't, you just wear a white shirt and open collar and no tie and his beard and everything. I think that's him. So anyway, uh, this kind of, if you don't really know anything about the energy Vende, this kind of like helps you out a little bit, I think. And so this is what I wanted to talk about. This is why I'm so bullish on commodities and resources, even like I said, sec in a secular type situation. Um, I don't, I'm not picking on African people. I'm actually quite bullish on Africa because of the positive demographics. You know, it's a place of 52 or 54 countries. Uh, they're not all basket cases. There's a difference between Equatorial Guinea, which is a hellhole, and, you know, country like, you know, Namibia or Botswana or even Rwanda or Tanzania. So, um, but the thing about it is, is that, as we've talked about before, in order for the development and of a country, you need larger and larger um, energy inputs. And so somebody made a meme here. It says a power transmission line in Africa, India, and Asia shows these women walking in the line carrying basically firewood that they've went out and gathered on top of their heads. It's a transmission line. I, 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 again, it's not to goof on these people. It's to illustrate a point. There are 800 million, a billion people that have never flipped the light switch. There are people that are in these developing countries and as they develop and as the governments have a desire to better the life of their people to make them wealthier because along with wealth comes what easier living more efficiencies all of these things requires larger and larger energy inputs okay and this is why you need to be bullish i think on a secular level on energy because we haven't invested enough in energy or commodities in order to um, you know, fulfill these people's desires and dreams and where they are going. And so this is the opportunity. Again, most people, this is from Alex Epstein, I think I got this tidbit from him. Most people in Africa use less energy than an average American refrigerator uses. So you, the energy that your refrigerator uses, which is a great convenience because it allows you to store food. I mean, I don't have to get into why a refrigerator and freezer in your home is so convenient and so necessary. But the energy to sustain that, most people in Africa use less energy in, in, their, in their daily life than that refrigerator uses. That's a tremendous opportunity. And, you know, the colonial wars of the 60s, the decolonization efforts, a lot of the corruption. Yes, there's there's corruption in Africa in some countries. There's hell holes there. You know, I wouldn't want to live in Chad or Equatorial Guinea or Liberia. But there's, like I said, there's also positive things happening, okay? 
And uh, I think that's going to continue. And demographically, I mean, this is where a lot of the growth is. And that's going to require tremendous amounts of energy as these places uh, basically grow up. And so this is a chart that shows that you have uh, basically um, GDP per capita. You have all the countries here. You know, you have United States up here, um, United Arab Emirates, you know, all of these high GDP per capita countries, Singapore. I mean, basically all your developed countries. And here's their per capita CO2 emissions because CO2 being, you know, byproduct of the use of fossil fuels. And so you see, okay, you have Congo down here, Burundi, Liberia. There's virtually no emissions because there's no economic activity going on. And you see as these countries, it's very simple. As the countries move up and get wealthier, the CO2 levels go up. Uh, I'm not going to get it, and that's because of the energy usage. It's that simple. So you see the um, uh, you see this scatter plot. What this means, um, and this is why you have people like you know people that have adopted uh, CO2 as the their new devil or Satan or evil that they must uh, deal with, um, and it probably will happen in the West. I mean, the West is uh, self-immolating. It's performing ritual seppuku and energy suicide in many cases, but the rest of the world's not going to do that. The 80%, 85% of the world that doesn't subscribe to the WEF or the Anglo-American uh, nonsense that's going on with um, um, the WEF and CO2 and all this stuff, the rest of the world's not playing that game because people don't like being poor. And in order to not be poor, you require larger and larger energy inputs. And that's not going to come from Siemens Gamesa uh, wind turbines. It's just not. All right, that's it for this week. Uh, again, um, appreciate all of the viewership. Um, again, if you're interested in how we take advantage of these uh, ideas that we talk about in these videos, consider a subscription to the Actionable Intelligence Alert newsletter. It's 150 bucks a year, 12 issues. Uh, we, I talk about different companies and different ways to take advantage and to profit from the themes that we talk about in these videos. So that's available. If you're interested in that, you can check that out in the show notes below. Thank you for listening and supporting the channel, and we'll talk to you next week. Thank you, guys.